at the end of this webinar, you will be able to talk about uh, what are the unique issues of scalp, because scalp is not just regular skin, uh, what makes it unique, uh, what are the basic ecosystem, how to keep it healthy, and what means we have to keep it healthy. So this is the center of this presentation. So let's start with understanding what is scalp. Scalp is characterized by the following thing. It's a thick layer of the skin, okay? And it has high concentration of follicles and sebaceous gland. Sebaceous gland are the gland that produce sebum, oil. So it makes it very unique because of this structure. Different temperature approaches the scalp and the follicles. The outside temperature is different from the inside, the deeper layer of the scalp. The air temperature is of course different from the skin temperature. Now the pH is also different. The surface of the scalp has a pH of about 5.5. However, the hair shaft has a pH of 3.67. And the blood actually inside deeper of the scalp has a pH of about 7.4. So we are dealing with an environment that changes in both temperature and also in pH. These conditions of fluctuating temperature and pH are very favorite for the growth of different type of fungi fungi and bacteria. And these are causing different diseases such as dandruff, seborrheic dermatitis, and so on, even lice. So this is the picture of the scalp. You see the different hair follicles and the sebaceous gland approach them. So this is very unique to the scalp and will different, differentiate the scalp from the regular skin. When we look at the skin from the outside, of course, we see the hair and the skin around this. When you see the skin is, is dry, typically it will bring eventually result with dandruff. Uh, many times people mistake dandruff with other diseases that look like dandruff, like seborrheic dermatitis, and you can see it in the picture. And other diseases on the skin are, of course, lice, and lice is typical to the skin. Now, my approach today will be only cosmetic to the skin and hair and body in general. I'm not going to talk about OTC and RX, I just will mention a few. So what are the cosmetic issues relating to scalp? First of all, people feel that the scalp is dry and they are looking for moisturizers. The dryness can also appear as dandruff. Some people claim about oily hair. It's also re related to dandruff. And dandruff is everything to do with flakes on the surface of uh, the scalp. And sometimes it comes to itching and dry feeling. So these are symptoms of something that's happening on the scalp. Let's try to understand it a little bit clearly from the physiological point of view. And if you listen to this, you will understand what solutions we can give to address the issues. So in a healthy scalp, we have a moisturized, hydrated skin with growing hair. Something may happen, and we have excess of sebum production. The sebum is coating the hair, and that's why we call it oily hair. There is excess of sebum on the scalp, and the sebum now becomes food for multiple bacteria and fungi. Okay, so bacteria and fungi are growing and they cause irritation, dry scalp, shading, and eventually what we can see as dandruff. 
So this is the cycle of events. Now, if we look at this number two, what comes first, the bacteria, the fungi, or the excess of sebum? I don't know, but you definitely need to have the sebum and you need to have the fungi. We all have the fungi, but we may not have excess of sebum and conditions, and I will talk about this in a minute. So let's understand what is dandruff. In order to have dandruff, you have to have three conditions. Three, not only one. First of all, we need to have the microbe. The microbe is a yeast. Malagesia globosa. This is the Latin name. Simple words, it's a yeast. The existence of the yeast is critical to get dandruff. Even if you don't see the yeast, the yeast looks like this, as you can see it in scanning electron microscope. But you see the dandruff, you know there is yeast activity. Number two is excess of sebum. The yeast is feasting on the sebum. You can see excess of sebum by having wet or oily hair. Then you can see the dandruff, the flakes. The condition number three is sensitivity, genetic sensitivity to the conditions. Many people may have oily skin, oily hair, may have the yeast, but they will not have dandruff because they don't have the sensitivity. So these are the three conditions to have dandruff. Seborrheic dermatitis is a disease which is a little bit similar to typical dandruff because it has flake, itching, and oily uh, scalp, but it's different. You can see here the oily areas of the scalp. It's different because you may be able to see that there are other areas of the skin that are more oily than others. So the patches of oil on the skin in other places than the scalp indicates that this is a different disease. But the actual symptoms, the flaky, itchy, and oily scalp are the same. We are not going to deal with dermatological diseases. I'm just giving you a little bit of background so we know how to address it from the cosmetic point of view. So how come that we feel itchy? How it's all happening? Why from the yeast we suddenly feel itchy? So I take you a little bit, uh, uh, dive into the physiology and the biochemistry. Because if you understand the biochemistry, you will understand better how to formulate a solution to the problem. So now it starts by we have the fungus. The fungi, the yeast, um, has different enzymes. One of the interesting enzymes, it's called lipase. Lipase works on lipids, and the sebum is, of course, lipids. As it works on, in other words, it accelerates the oxidation of triglyceride into different types of fatty acid. Now, we can get two types of fatty acids, saturated and non-saturated. The saturated fatty acid, okay, are consumed by the fungi, and they continue to grow. So this is the best food for the fungi. So the fungi is actually cooking their own meal. What's happening with the unsaturated fatty acid? And this is our enemy. The unsaturated fatty acid divide into two groups. The first one is the alkydonaic acid. And this acid, initiate inflammatory response. That's why we get the redness. The other unsaturated is oleic acid. Oleic acid specifically causes the irritation. So now you understand how and what is the mechanism that causes dandruff. It starts with the fungus. The fungus digesting the sebum into byproduct that support their own growth and also support the irritation and the inflammation effect. So now we have the question, how, can, uh, how do we get the itchiness? 
So we need, again, the sebum and the fungi. This is how it looks like. They produce oleic acid, alkidionic acid, and what is oleic acid? You see, oleic acid is a monounsaturated fatty acid. And this is the molecule that causing about 50% of the population irritation, about 50%. So the scalp starts to become inflamed, reddish, and itchy. And after that, we see that the cells are shading and we see the dandruff. So this is the chain of processes that cause us problems on our scalp. Now the question is, how to get rid of dandruff? So dandruff is a disease and it has to be handled by OTC and RX uh, materials and not cosmetics. So I would define that we in the cosmetic industry can prevent it from happening, but we cannot actually uh, treat it as a drug. So um, what the drugs are doing when they are using an anti-dentroph shampoo, conditioner, or so on, they handle the cause of the disease, which is inhibiting the fungi. So all the actives, I show you a few, are the purpose of those ingredients is to stop the activities of the fungi. Uh, stop is mean fungicide, or they also can be just holding it like a fungus tape. So less is emphasized on reducing the symptoms. Less of um, the purpose of the OTC or RX ingredient is less focus on reducing the itchiness or redness. The belief is that we kill the bacteria or the fungi, uh, we will reduce the symptom as well. Now there are different groups of antifungal APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients. The most common is zinc pyridium and zinc carbonate. Both of them work to eliminate the fungi. This is the structure of zinc pyridium. It's a little bit more complex. You see there are four different rings associated with a zinc atom. And the product itself are dry particles. What do we need to know about this? And how this connected to technology? In case you are an OTC company and you would like to make a better anti dandruff solution. So for all I can tell you that I'm familiar with this material because it is a pesticide. So zinc perithion is a pesticide. It used to prevent growth of bacteria, fungi, mildew, algae in uh, agriculture, in plastic materials, and so on. So it's a very harsh material. I mentioned before that the scalp is very sensitive, temperature, pHs, and so on. If we add materials such as zinc perithion, it really could change the balance, and we'll talk about this in a minute. The other technical issue with this material and other antifungal materials is their low solubility in water. Their solubility is limited to 0.8% in natural pH. However, the FDA recommended use level is anywhere between 0.25, which is very low, but most of the product using one and 2%, which means they're using a level above its solubility, which means in order to solubilize it, they have to use other ingredients that help solubility like alcohol. And as you know, we don't like to use alcohol on our skin and definitely not on our scalp because they're drying it. Other materials, include ketocatazole. Again, the use level is 0.25 to 2%, very low solubility in water, but it's soluble in alcohol and then water. Climbazole, also 0.25 to 2. These are less common in our market, but in some countries they are using more frequently. The same technical problem appears 
because of the low solubility, they have to use alcohol as a solvent. And of course, a technology could help solve it by dispersing it in kind of sub-micron spheres, and then the use of alcohol may not be necessary. Okay, now I want to move away from OTC and our X product and look at the cosmetic area. What else we can offer? So the candidate's best material is our salicylic acid. So what do we know? The salicylic acid is known to be an anti-acne ingredient with a dose of 0.5 to 2% as the OTC. What salicylic acid is doing? It's exfoliating. It's basically, in this case, can accelerate the clearing of flakes of dandruff. We also know from clinical experience that shampoos and other wash-off applications with salicylic acid can help treat both seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff. So there is a substantial data to show that this is very effective. Now, FDA dosage for dandruff is anywhere between 1.5 to 6% of salicylic acid. So what is the problem? You can see in the picture. The problem is the solubility in water is limited to 0.2%. 0.2% is too low for treatment, especially for dandruff treatment. Okay, so this is the problem. What is the challenge? This is actually the challenge, how to solubilize salicylic acid into a water-based product without using alcohol or other harsh surfactant that enable the solubility. The second one is how to increase the fact that it's drying the skin, the burning, and the redness that caused by salicylic acid in general. So our suggestion and our technology is based on hydrosol. Now briefly about hydrosol. And what is hydrosol all about? I explained in our previous webinars, but I briefly will come back to this. Hydrosol unique function as a, a micro encapsulation system is the ability to disperse the salicylic acid. I use the word disperse and not solubilize. Okay, it disperses the salicylic acid. So one can incorporate it in any product form relatively easily. So it's easy to formulate with this. It disperses it and then it forms a film on surface. The uniqueness of hydrosol compared to other technologies that we offer is its surface affinity. It's not like salt sphere that stick to fat regions, fat domains of the skin. This is adhering to general surface. When we have lots of surface is generally the scalp and definitely the hair. So this is a technology for surface affinity and deposition. You understand now that without the affinity and the deposition, we cannot expect to get a long lasting. Why do we want a long lasting? Because we don't want to dump all the salicylic acid or whatever ingredients we use all at once. We want to release it gradually so the skin can absorb it, metabolize it, and benefit from this. Otherwise, exposure to the whole amount at once could cause to irritation, dryness of the skin, and so on. And this is the major feature of hydrosol in this composition. Because of this feature, hydrosol allows to increase compliance so people can use it more frequently, as, uh, definitely as they should. Therefore, they can see how it heals and improve the skin. So this is the basic feature of hydrosol over any other technology, the surface affinity and deposition, which are critical for gradual release. And we are talking about biological processes and biological processes require 
slow release, small dosages over longer time.